don't see too many gangs. Is it, is it, it's, but it's more cartels there, right? Uh, what is it? Like? Uh, it's it's more uh, like a drug lord. Okay. So you have a drug lord, and he has his area. He okay. takes care of this area, and, uh, and okay. he has his soldiers. Let's say that you know okay. people who are there making money because it's basically a work. If you look to the favelas, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, okay. the big favelas, people are poor there. Okay. They need job. Yeah. So what the drug lords do? They hire young guys, young people, to sell the drugs. Got it. It's a business. And it's, it's a huge, huge millionaire business. Welcome, Nico, to the studio. Um, you're, uh, you immigrated from uh, Brazil uh, about five years ago. Welcome to LA. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that's right. Uh, so uh, you were one of the first people. Well, actually, I, I was one of the first people I believe that you met when you came from the airport because I was I'm a, I know one of your family members. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, what were you doing in Brazil? What made you come? Tell us a little about it. OK, uh, let me start a little bit back, go a little bit back on that. So I am the youngest of four brothers and so it looks like I was the last one to came out okay. from my parents' house okay. back in Brazil. And I enjoyed a little bit more of everything there, you know. And my father always taught me to always pursue some courses, courses on, on life, yeah. you know, some extra learning. Yeah. And I ended up on the IT uh, area. So in Brazil, you were doing like uh, IT stuff uh, is that is that what you were going into like computers and um technology or yeah basically everything on technology so i worked for about 10 years there uh taking care of traffic enforcement equipment oh okay so that's speed limit uh equipment radars all those kind of things and so so that's like cameras or this is just like something that senses that's talking about speed is that everything everything cameras uh, camera sensors, uh, all different kind of sensors, radars, laser, so all those things. Sure. Yeah. So in Brazil, uh, you decide. So you, how did you, how did you even get into this? How, how did you get into that in Brazil? Okay, uh, I think I have an inclination for for electronics and for technology. Yes. Since a little young, I remember my daughter, my sister playing with me, okay, you can disassemble any radio, but you cannot assemble that back again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know. break things. Break <laughs> things, yes, exactly. <laughs> and when I was about 20 years old, I went to the technical school. Okay. And I graduated as a technician, electronic technician. And that's for digital and telecommunication. So does this pay in, in Brazil? And, and which, which part of Brazil were you in? I'm from the very south. The state is Paraná. It, and that's, uh, that's what, f two, three hours south of Sa Sao Paulo? Yeah, it's about uh, eight hours. Uh, oh, eight well, hours? Le less than that. Five hours. Five hours? South and from Sao Paulo. So uh, in Brazil, when you were learning this stuff, like wages-wise, so this is a good paying job over there or this is not, a, how's the money in Brazil or what you can achieve with what you were doing in? Okay. Uh, the wages you're going to build as you grow in the company. Okay. So if you are a good professional, you have a starting eight wages and that will develop with you over the years. Okay. Okay. So basically you build a career there. Okay. That's for, for everybody. Yes. So, a good technician, he can make uh, really good money for for uh, for living, you know, for for all his expenses for sure. Okay. So so, uh, so uh, that with a technician, could you buy a house over there? Like, was it challenging? Uh, uh, how the economy is now, twenty twenty one, probably not. Okay. Will be will be a challenge. Will be hard. Okay. But. Some years ago, yes. I, I bought my house okay. being a technician back there. 
So w- where did the idea of wanting to come to America, when when did you decide that this is, oh, maybe I want to do this? And I, I know that you have family members here. So what, what, what encouraged you? Where did it spark in your life? Okay. Uh, we always had the, the desire to change, to change to better. Yeah. Always, always. I think that's our, in our bloodstream, right? Changing, pursuing what is better, okay? And back in 2015, that was a year prior, prior to come here to the U.S., we were not struggling, but trying to find ways to be better, to go to the next step, to mm-hmm. run our second mile. So I was at that point finishing my master's degree in product development. Oh, okay. And we just found out, okay, maybe we can do a inter interchange culture program or something like that. And then my wife and I, we decided to come visit our families here, okay. our members. And we w- ended up in Utah, okay. where we live now, okay. right? <laughs> wow. And uh, that was interesting because we found all the nature, all the beauty of the state, all the warmth of the people, and we, we just decided we can do more. So you, you didn't feel like how Brazil was, because Brazil, Brazil is very green too, and you didn't feel like that was there too, like you didn't have that there, or was it, um, that part was missing? Because obviously Utah and Brazil, have, I, I would think on pictures, Brazil is beautiful. Oh yeah, it is. Uh, so when you came and you, you see Utah, so it was the people, or it's the place, or is it the opportunities? Uh, maybe it's a combination of everything. So when you think uh, south of Brazil, it's a little bit different from the all the rest of the Brazil. Okay. So the state that I came from, Paraná, specifically Curitiba, we have a joke there that we have been practicing social distance for the whole life. Oh, is <laughs> <laughs> so the COVID was not a problem there, okay. you know. And uh, maybe that thing is it's missing, you know, in our lives. Not not the the social distancing, but the trying to find warm. Got it. So people. People. Yes, exactly. And I used to travel a lot on my last job there in Brazil. So I was basically all the time traveling uh, around the whole Brazil, going to some other uh, countries. And I s- all the time saw people like uh, coming and hugging you, like, hey, come on, welcome, you know. And that was always a little bit different. In Utah, we found a little bit of that, too. Wow. You know, we when we arrived there, people definitely, definitely came to us and, like, hugging us, you know, like, like family, you know, that I can I can be more specific in that was in Provo, yeah. Utah. Yeah. I don't know if that's a very young, uh, not not a young city, but it's an upcoming city. Yes, and yes. Oh, that was awesome. You know, we we definitely felt at home. Got it. So, so one day you just decide you pick up your bag. So so this is when you came on vacation, right? Yes, and mm-hmm. then you go back. Is that what happened? So you end up going back to you to no. Oh, okay. Uh. That, that's that. That's a different and very interesting story. Okay. Because we just packed our suitcase, five family members, my wife and I, and three children. So we packed maybe four uh, suitcase, okay. right, for a vacation wow. for some days. So your house and is still there. Your stuff is still there. Your car is still there. Yeah. So at that time, <laughs> everything was there. And we just came and we stayed. Wow. So then we, that, that, that was hard because we had to, to sell things, to organize things, everything remotely. So that takes some effort, you know. Uh, luckily, we have our family still there. We, we still have a business there with an electronic shop. Wow, okay. So the, everything's still working there somehow. So now, when you scared... Like, you're obviously, when I first met you, you almost spoke very little English. I mean, very, very little. I, I mean, but you were a happy guy, but you <laughs> spoke very little English. But when you scared that you had um, your family's responsibility on your shoulders, you've got your kids, 
you're coming to a country where you don't speak the language you're going to rely on people now because obviously you were the man of the house in brazil and were providing and doing everything you were doing weren't you scared like coming here to um go through that like with your family because you've just taken a very big risk yeah uh at that time we we saw all the risks however we saw all the opportunities okay so the first thing that i did when we decided to stay here was going through the immigration process so at that at that point i was uh i had a tourist visa yes. so i had to work out to go to a student visa to be able to study get more opportunities yes. everything else so that was a challenge the story making the story short we went to two immigration lawyers and they they told us go back to brazil so now you're going through this process years into this and you're, you're getting everything taken care of and then it's just how do you keep um but at that moment when you're going through this you're still very nervous right because you don't know how things are going to go is it going to go good is it going to go bad exactly how do you handle this like um, in, internally yeah. like how do you deal with it in yourself okay anxiety is a problem always you know, I think everybody has a little bit of anxiety in their lives. Okay. And my wife worked with me to transform that anxiety in a way to find opportunities to change. Right. The change was the point because we definitely want to change. Right. So when I got my student visa, I started school. Okay. First for an English. Okay, and this is where yeah. your English came from? Yes, okay. basically, yes. I okay. I used to play that. I thought that I knew English before coming here. But when I went to the drive-thru, I discovered <laughs> that I didn't. Because <laughs> <You> did. <laughs> the, 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 the speaker was like, talk with me. And I, I didn't know I, what, like, rah, 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 what is that? I said, yeah. I don't know. Like, yes, yes, yes. And I'll I got take a two. Different. I'll take yeah. two. Exactly. <laughs> Num number twos. <laughs> so that, that, that was an awesome okay. experience. Okay. And I think everything, everything that, not mistakes that we make when we are learning a new language, it's fun it. because it's opportunity to learn and improve. So with your kids, how, how old were your kids when you moved? Okay. Uh, now they are 12 and 14 years old, two girls and a boy who is 17. Oh, okay. So back in five years, so my son was 12, my daughter eight, and the other 10, so. W were you thinking about their upbringing, like how they would be brought up versus Brazil versus here? Did, was that, uh, obviously that's a part of the process of thinking what's best for them. What did you think over there they would be doing? Like if you thought, if you were to imagine yourself living there for the rest of your life, where do you think your kids would have been versus okay. where you think they're going today? Okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, subject because that was not a weight, you know, but when we tried to balance that, it was easy. Uh, I'll give an example of what's going on now, okay? Because that don't, don't change too much over the years. So if you go back five years ago, no pandemic, everything perfect, perfect life, everything running, we can compare almost with today. My kids here, they are going to school. My son is in a high school now. Everything's running perfect. If we look to Brazil now, students, they still at home, struggling to study, struggling to have things, you know, the basic, the basic. Yeah. So if we look what they could have there and what they have now, it's about 20 years difference wow okay so they would be they were ahead over here much it? much 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 ahead but what about like uh growing up like uh, w w over there like there's a lot more poverty in brazil than in america right well america's getting bad now but there was a lot of poverty in brazil yeah so was there gangs over there was there um uh, like were you not worried like your son was going to get into trouble because boys get in more trouble than yeah. uh, than girls <laughs> were you worried about that part of um their upbringing well we live in the south of Brazil. And Chiriba, right? Ch how do you say Chiriba? Curitiba. Curitiba. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. And Curitiba, 
All the south of Brazil is a little bit different from the rest of Brazil. Okay. However, we still have problems with drugs, uh, guns. We have all those problems. Right. And the young people, they do. Because they want a nice shoes. They want a motorcycle. Mm. They, they want to have stuff. But they can't have a job. Because Brazil don't have jobs. But you got very lucky when you were there, though, to have that, right? Because most people don't get that, and you went along the right path versus uh, other people who get forced to uh, to go into this lifestyle over there. Yeah. Um, so was it bad? Like, uh, so when you were thinking about your son, and you think about when he was there, did you were you concerned that your son would follow this path too, or you felt okay? No, we've done a good thing, and he's going to go the correct way. Well, I will I will compare that to myself. My father, he always taught the whole family equally. So we we got the best education we possibly could get. Okay. My father all, was all the time advising me, okay, don't do that. That's bad. Guess what? I failed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I failed. So I could do the best for my son, mm-hmm. but he's outside there. Yes. When he's home, I don't have a full fully control. Even here, I don't have full control. What he does when he's on the street is about him. He can fail. We can fail at any time. So the chances, I could say that's 50-50, here or or there. But the 50% there is much more likely to happen than here. You know the households in Brazil are both parents. In America, you, you probably realize that we, a lot of people work a lot. There's mm-hmm. a lot of working over here to survive because it's very hard to keep up your lifestyle. So everybody's got their foot on the gas to work, make money, pay for household, pay for rent, pay for car, pay for children's dental, pay for this, pay for that. In in Brazil, was the households, with the with the women primarily at home and the men would go to work? Is that how most of the households were? Or was, this, was it equal over there? It's, it's changing a lot. It's basically weekly now because... But before? Yeah, but, you know, what's going on, it's as the economy goes bad, both parents need to work to provide your home. So uh, it's good to see that women are having much more opportunities now. Yes. By the way, yesterday I was talking to a friend, and he told me, oh, my supervisor is uh, that woman. I said, wow, that's amazing, because she was not a supervisor. So she became a supervisor. One thing that I pray and, and fight for is that the women can have the same wages. Because we know that all over the place, no matter where, they still not having the same of a man. But are you so talking about primarily in America or are you talking in Brazil? Both. Both. Okay. Everywhere. Everywhere do, I see do that. Do you feel it's worse in Brazil than over here? Oh, yes. It is. It is? It is. Mm-hmm, definitely. Um, what was your wife doing in Brazil? Uh, she was a lawyer. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. so she graduated. She that's, started. That's not how you guys met, where she got you out of jail. Is <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Almost. <no. laughs> and um, yeah, she she became a lawyer about uh, two or three years before we okay. came here. Okay. And she started working on some process and everything else. But that was awesome. That was some cases, you know. She had the opportunity to help. We have... We have a uh, houses there that's for uh, for the youth. They are trying to get out from the streets to go back to society. Okay. And she had the opportunity to work on one of those houses. And she said that it was terrible. It's the worst thing that she could see was a, a, a young boy uh, trying to get rid of drugs, you know, trying to get yeah. out of that situation with no parents, yeah. you know, living on the streets. And uh, she she got a really good experience on that. So so now you guys have come to, uh, you come to the US. Um, life is more busier than normal, uh, just to keep up. Um, how do you keep yourself so positive? You're, you're a very positive guy, and obviously the, the language is a, has been a barrier for you, because we, we know we've spoken. Uh-huh. And, uh, how do you keep up with that? Because every, everybody likes you. You do a lot of volunteer work. <laughs> and um, everybody sees you're always a very positive person. I see it on a regular basis. <laughs> how, how do you stay so positive? What, what keeps you happy? 
what, what's, our, what's happiness for what you? What drives me happy, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, one thing that drives me happy first is my family, obviously. I have really huge support at home. And that's that, that is important. Because as you, as you said, we need to keep ourselves busy here in the West for yeah. everything. We are always busy, yes. always busy. No matter what you do, you are busy. Yeah. And we have to find a balance between home, studies, you know, whatever we are doing. We have to find that balance. And to find happiness on those times, you first need to find yourself where you are. And that, that is hard. And you have to have support. You have to have friends around you. You have to have people around you. I like to talk. Yeah. And, you know, even if I don't know the perfect English, I know that I can communicate. Yeah. And communication is important. But you're also practicing at the same time, right? Because exactly. now you're learning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a two, it's two, two wins for yeah. me, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So what, what you said about uh, everybody likes me. Yeah. I, I got feedbacks all the time and I say, how? I can see myself inspiring people. Yeah. At school, I give some talks. Uh, inspirational and motivational talks at school for uh, there are all international students learning English as I am and other day I caught myself speaking to everybody and there were people crying say what's wrong what yeah. did, what did it wrong and in the end people were like raising hands and saying thank you thank you thank you and you know it's, it's just part of me and one thing that I, I want to do is spread, spread happiness, yeah. spread uh, the good things. And all these ended up that I, as you said, uh, I'm volunteering at the hospital, yeah. Chimpanooks Hospital in Orem, yes. Utah. I started there in a, in a committee that I was awesome. I still doing that. Uh, because of the pandemic, some, some little things are paused now there. Yes. But last year, I was invited to uh, by the CEO. Because I remember you have your picture on the wall at the hospital. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it was a very proud moment for you, right? Because that's yeah. a very big accomplishment. <laughs> you know, I'm the only immigrant there on yeah. that wall. Yes. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing, you know. It's, it's an achievement. You it's achieved achievement. something. Yeah. You say, hey, I uh, come here and, I, and I'm the guy who's got my picture on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I, I told, I told uh, the CEO at the hospital, he called me. You know, say, can you can you come here and we have a talk? I have an uh, opportunity for you to serve in the hospital. I volunteer. Yeah. Say, yeah, why not? And it was incredible because I told him, why? And he said, because you are a good man. Yeah. You are doing the difference. Yes. I say, how? I said, you are. And that's that. That's good. That's and good to hear that. And you know, inside our heart, you yes. know. And you, you are. And I see the stuff that you do. You are extremely helpful. You help everybody under the sun, whether you know them or you don't know them. And I've seen this from you. And especially when you've got your own issues going on, of saying, okay, I've got this in my life going on. I've got to take care of my kids. I'm trying to learn the language, but you're still helping people, which I find amazing. And that's the part which I yeah. find amazing. Which, and I always tell you this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very hard being an international student. I was an international student myself when I came to America. It's extremely hard because it's they, you're forced to go to school and you got to keep up with everything, trying to figure out how does it work. It's, it's, it's yeah. tough. Yeah, and it that's is. why I said you always, always stay positive. I'm, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> very people, inspirational. People sometimes don't realize, but okay, and you go to school after, after a, a long day. Yes, I do. Yeah. And guess what? I got a part-time job at school, <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I'm proud of, yes. you know, because that provides me the chance to pay my tuition, yes. pay my own expenses at school yes. with my labor, yes. legally. Yes. That's, that's amazing. Yes. I love that. So sometimes some friends from Brazil, we, we chat and they, they said, okay, but what do you do at school? You work in the library, you yeah. work in the office? No, no, no. I clean the school. Yes. Proudly, I say that I clean the school, and I'm so happy when I do that. I'm so happy. Yeah, and, and when I was going to school, so the only job that they were letting me have was uh, you could only work in the bookstore. Oh, the really? problem was I was not an A plus student, so it was based on your grades. So I'm on the the Ds and the Fs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm trying to say, hmm, how do I get into school? <laughs> but I, I, I started business and I did things a little different. That's cool. But um, so 
so what do you do in your your time over here? So I know that oh I know you brought me a teacher because you started yes. a, like a, a, a little club, <laughs> a little motorcycle club, which is very cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where did the motorcycle drive riding come from? How did okay. that? Okay, uh, that's not a long story, but story, but it's it's nice, interesting. Okay. I I love motorcycles. I love motorcycles. Since my 12 years old, I love motorcycles. Is that driving on the two wheels or the one wheel? Uh, <laughs> now on two wheels. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will make this story a little bit longer, okay? okay. If you don't mind. Okay. Uh, I was 12 to 13 years old. Okay. A friend of mine had uh, a scooter to yeah. sell. Okay. And I told my father, I want to buy that school. Can you help me? That scooter. Can you help me? And he said, okay, let's see that. And my friend la never let me ride that scooter because he knows that I was a little bit crazy yeah. about bikes, you know. And my father came to see the bike. And that was nice. We started, bam, bam, yeah. amazing. And I asked the guy, can I sit on that? I said, yeah. I said, and run. Wow. When I came back, my father said, no, you're not going to have it. It's too dangerous. You don't forget it. I said, wow. Okay, so at that point, 12, 13 year, years old, I figured out that I'll never have a motorcycle. Oh, yeah. Then my brother came home one day with a motorcycle. I said, yes, I started again. Playing. This is your older brother who had a motorcycle? Yes. Okay. Playing with that a little bit. Uh, then I had an accident, uh, not on a motorcycle, but I have an accident with a table saw when I cut my fingers oh, off, Okay. right? So when I cut my fingers, the first thing that I thought was, how can I ride a motorcycle? That, that was primarily my... And how old were you when this happened? It was 14. I was 14. 14 years old? Yes. And how did that happen, if you don't mind me asking? How did it... Uh, okay. My father bought uh, a table saw for construction because he was doing some repairs at home. And the employees, they were not there. The machine was there alone. My mother said, oh, can you cut some piece of food for me for the stove in? Say that, that. I said, oh, I know what? Yeah, I can do that. And I can tell that, that was a quite experience because when I started the machine and started cutting the, the woods, the piece of wood, it came into my mind saying, use an ax. Don't use the, the saw. Wow. Okay. And that came three times, three times in my mind. And I ignored that warning. I can tell that that's the. So this is your gut telling you, hey, don't use the saw. Exactly. Use an axe. Exactly. And I remember on the third piece of wood, I cut my fingers <sighs> off. That was, for me, it was like, like, okay, I cut. I didn't felt anything, just a shock on my body. I ran to my mom, was just us at home. I said, hey, mom, look what happened. And she, like, started screaming, and then I came out to the street asking for help. And a neighbor came, took me to the hospital. And your mom, at this moment, uh, has she, she fainted? Uh, she, she freaked out. Poor, poor woman, I can tell you. Oh, I can that imagine. I could, uh, my son has a, a, a cut in his hand, a fa face, <laughs> and I'm, I'm already freaking out. Yeah, you know, for my mom, that was terrible. That was terrible. Terrible mom, moment. And you're the her. youngest, you're the baby the of the youngest, house. Yes. Oh, wow. And, but, you know, that never, never hit me hard. Uh, I used to have a friend that didn't have his fingers to. And so, you know what? I'm going to be like him. He's happy, yeah. you know? So my fingers, my hand was never uh, a barrier for anything, yeah. for anything. I never used that as, a, an, as an excuse yeah. for anything. Yeah. There's no reason. There's no reason. And... When I turned turn, uh, 20, 21, I definitely said, I'm going to get my, motors, my first bike, my first motorcycle. Yeah. I went to DMV back in Brazil. I said, okay, I want to get my endorsement. And so oh, you have to go through some special tests because of your hand. And I said, okay, let's do it. And I remember clearly when I came out from the doctor's office at the DMV, with his signature saying, you are approved. Wow. I called to everybody, <laughs> okay. everybody said, I got it, I got it. Yeah. That was awesome. So my passion for motorcycle, it's, I don't know, it came from years back. 
So if you lost your arms and legs, then you're going to say, I still will be on a motorcycle. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, no matter what, I will be on a motorcycle. Okay. And this group came uh, here in Utah. Uh, what happened was... It, and it's an interesting name, mototherapy. Mototherapy, That's yes. an interesting name. Yes, it is. I, I will explain to you why this logo and why everything. Because it has a story on that. Not story, but it has a purpose on everything. And uh, we basically have about 25 riders now in our group, and all Brazilians. Okay. Why we found ourselves on this group? There's a lack of friendship when you are immigrant and you come from another, no matter where, you need to feel that you belong. Yes. And for a lot of people, they can't find this belonging feeling. Yeah. It, it, it's like we have an area over here and it's like all the, like it's called uh, Artesia and it's like all the Indian community get over there because they want to feel connected with each other. You have the same stores, same things, but please go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And a lot of Brazilians, they were getting alone. Definitely getting alone. Uh, no friends, nobody to hang out. Uh, there's different culture just to more relate to you to right so you need exactly. something to relate to how you once were how things were even though everyone's nice but just there's a deeper connection of what you once had right? exactly okay. exactly and the motorcycle came in between so a friend one day called me and say hey you're going to a ride you want to join us say yes absolutely i would love wow. it wow. and then we start to strain our relationships at the point that we made the group, say, okay, guys, let's ride, let's ride. Let's ride. But we were not organized. In that, that point, that was hard. And it was hard until one, two months ago. Because yeah. every time, let's ride, yeah, let's ride. But let's run, let's do whatever you want. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. That we are not organized. Uh, then one of the, 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 the guys came and said, hey, let's have a logo. Yeah. Let's have a logo. And we open ev everything for all the group. We don't have a president. We don't have yeah. nothing like that. But we are one, one, yeah. one group. And we came with this logo, which is the Mototherapy. Yeah. It's, it's like abbreviation, combination name of motorcycle and therapy. Yeah. Because it's something that we have. We have to have a therapy. Do you, do you make everybody get tattoos? Oh, uh, not yet. Group? Not yet. But we are planning on that. <laughs> So does that mean I'm not allowed to join the group because I'm uh, not Brazilian? Or do I get on an honorary pass? Everybody is welcome <laughs> to our group. And we have one American there wow, already. Wow. That's, that's cool. That's good. So explain a little bit of the logo. The mountains yeah. represent uh, Utah. The motorcycle with the rider, us. Uh, the road is the path that we have to, to go through this life. Yeah. 2020 which is the toughest year for everybody. Yeah. And it was when we kept ourselves strong and we organized a lot of things in our groups and we came more close together and stronger, you know, our brotherhood, yes. you know. And uh, the circle is a shield that represent our families. Wow. So we try to get everything on purpose that you know it, i think that's important and where are you guys driving to so you go on long trips uh, I, I hear rumors on the streets that you guys are planning a trip to colorado yes so on the and, and on that's how, how is it sitting on a motorcycle for 10 hours how, how do you do that it's hard because it's, it's hard sitting in a car for 10 hours yes <laughs> <laughs> so it is interesting how things goes when you start to, to plan a long trip yeah. because there are some riders that they can't stay longer on a motorcycle. Other riders, they can't, yeah. you know? Because so your, your butt goes numb. Oh, <laughs> everything, everything comes numb. <laughs> Arms, hands, everything, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, I'll give you one example. On the 24th of um, last month, we went to Colorado, yeah. but we, we did a short trip. It was 500 miles only. And... Uh, that was interesting because we planned some stops for fuel, for rest, food. Didn't happen. 
as we planned because it was freezing. We got temperatures below like uh, 23 through the mountains. Yeah. That was terrible. Hands start freezing. Not all riders were prepared for that. So uh, as long as it's uh, freezing cold and no one's peeing just to keep themselves warm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I like to remember that, that there's a move, right, that the... Uh, when the person that do that and like they, oh, it's warm now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's it's hard. It's really hard. And we are planning now a three days trip to Colorado again. Yes. But that will be, we will be departing on the 29. That yeah. will be the Memorial uh, weekend. Yeah. So we'll be 29 riding all day long from Utah to Colorado to our, uh, to our point there. We are planning to stay Sunday at the house okay. there or maybe do a, a short uh, ride in the yeah. city something like that obviously most cycles are dangerous oh yes, yes they, are. they are because they say it's not when you're going to fall uh, if you're going to fall it's when you're going to fall uh, mm -hmm. have you ever fell off yes yet? yes you yeah. have fallen off oh no uh or been hit no no so do do you do you worry like with your wife and your kids in case something happens to you does that that right because my parents right now are still worried with me mm -hmm. train, saying hey don't get most because <laughs> if i fall off then who's gonna take care of my kids but are you, are you, are you worried about your wife and everything? yes uh, however i told them if i died on a motorcycle i want a fun funeral a motorcycle funeral wow. please wow. take a lot of motorcycles do noise you know everybody be happy because I definitely pass away doing what I love. Okay. So I really don't mind. So this is your number one thing? This is the one thing that you really love? This is your favorite thing? Besides, uh, I know electronics, you're fantastic. Uh, right? I love rollerblading too. Wow. So I like that, that skill I haven't seen you do yet. <laughs> yeah. You have to check my Instagram. I, I have I'm some videos there. I'm going to check it oh, out. I, I love it. I love it. I can tell you. <laughs> if I need to pick between motorcycle and rollerblading, what I do, I put my rollerblade on a backpack, my motorcycle, and I go wow. to a You <laughs> to don't have place. the motorcycle going while you're being pulled from behind? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were talking about the, mm -hmm. not the trip, yep. but uh, the, the motorcycle thing, you know, it's it's something incredible that brings brings you peace. Yes. It's, it's good. Yeah, and you get that feeling of motorcycle that you are alone and you feel powerful on it, right? I don't know oh, if it's yeah. the vibration of the of the bike and the speed that you have. It feels oh yeah, you feel very powerful. And there's yes. a there's a big rush. Yes, okay. yes, uh, definitely something that you become addicted, yes. and that becomes that comes the dangers yes. of the thing. You you have asked me about if I worry about my family, everything yeah. else. One of the premise is to have a motorcycle here in the US. Yeah. My wife came and said, okay, do you wanna have a motorcycle? Yes, I want. Okay, first thing, go and get your life insurance. Oh, there you go, that's it. So she, she's gonna, she's gonna yeah. be happy when you're gone. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, almost. Just, okay, now you can ride, 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 ride. She's just counting the days now. <laughs> but that's true, yeah. that's true, you know, because it's dangerous. Yes. We are the bumper. Yes. Motorcycles don't have bumpers. The rider is the bumper. That's right. So I got I got my gear every time I suit my gear, ride. Uh, I cannot say that I love speed. It's I speed, but speed is it's is a factor, and yeah. you know it's it's freedom. Yeah, it's when, only when tickets. You, you only get speeding tickets. Oh right? yeah, oh, right. Go to jail eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get pulled over gunpoint. It's yeah, <laughs> it's normal. It's not for a Brazilian. Oh, that's yeah. nothing. That's a, that's a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, but that, that was a point. Okay. okay do you want to have a motorcycle? Let's have a life insurance. Okay. Wow. Okay. It's, say, oh yeah, just that easy. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> why I'm going to tell my mom now. I'm going to get yeah. life insurance and make sure that they <laughs> can have money. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we want or not, you know, it's something that we have to think, yeah. to think about. If something happened, they will have a way to, you know, at least to conduct their lives yeah. until they can figure out yes. things. So it, it is important. I think that's important for everybody, you know. So what 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 are you trying to achieve? What what, what what's your goal? Like uh, what do, what do you want for your family now? Like what's your next goal for yourself, your family? I mean, you you look happy every time I see you. You're probably one of the happiest guys that I see. Uh, yeah. Helpfulest guys that I see. No one know uh, no one can see that anything's going bad in your life. You you carry yourself very tough. What are you looking what I what what are you aiming for? Okay. What do you want? 
life can change at any time any time we can be live now can get outside get a shot and it's done yeah so the primary thing now for me is to give my children a path that they can follow that they can go by themselves right they are all teenagers and i was explaining them the social media pressure yes you know it's not just influence it's pressure yes looks like everybody is racing against each other yes you know like if if you open my op open my instagram my life's perfect there yeah i ride my motorcycle i have barbecues yeah. my life's perfect it's perfect on instagram but i'm not trying to influence people to be like me i'm just showing some good things in life that I'm enjoying. So people need to understand that the social media is not only to influence you to do something because we start to racing. And yes. you, you don't want to race because eventually we'll be at last position. Yes, that's true. And then comes uh, depression, comes all those things that we don't want. Yes. So we need to be careful. Be careful what we see because we not we cannot compete. Yes. We are not in the same speed. See, I, I look at this as I call it the rat race. And we are all rats chasing this imaginary goal and there's always something better than what you have. Today I have a Ferrari, tomorrow I'll have the 2020, then I'm gonna have the 2021, mm -hmm. and then 2022 is gonna come out, then something with a bigger engine is gonna come out. And we're all chasing because we see people who have this or we think that everybody is is, is trying to go for this. I I, I see exactly. Yeah, exactly, from. exactly. And we don't need. We don't need. Yes. We need to find fulfillment in our lives, in, in what and how we do things, yes. and why. We have to find our why. That's right. If if you don't mind, I'd like to quote uh, Simon Sinek when he wrote his book. Okay. Start with why. Why. Uh, it's it's not easy to find our why you know but at some point we have to yeah. we have to find the purpose on things and little things you don't need to find the purpose i ah, okay i want to find find the purpose of life yeah. we will not find the purpose of life in one day in one hour you're gonna find the purpose of your life in your life yes in your lifetime I learned uh, one thing too with a therapist that I went uh, about a year, two years ago. It's about past, present, and future. That's right. All right? We don't have the past. Past is done. That's we it. cannot change. That's done. Right. Forget it. We can, we, obviously, we have memories, good memories, bad memories, where we can learn from that to not repeat the bad. Eventually, we will because we are as human beings, yes. we fail. We have now, today, the present, and the future. Yes. We need to control our anxiety because the future didn't happen yet. Will happen. We can plan the future, but the future can change yeah. and can eventually will not happen as we planned. Yeah. I, so now is important. I, 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 I agree with that. I, I believe that, you know, we can't plan what's going to happen. That's why when I make a, a plan, I don't make plans. I just do it. Mm -hmm. So if, whether it's a vacation to England or wherever I'm going, I plan it the week ahead and then I do it. Because if I plan it two months ahead, I, it goes wrong. And it, I think when I think about it too much, it creates anxiety. Yes. So exactly. that's why I just like to do it. I mm -hmm. just like to get it done just because if I'm thinking about how it's going to be and then my mind is thinking and then I'm going to do it like this and I'm thinking more and I'm thinking even more. And then all of a sudden say, man, I'm not going to do it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to do it. becomes a big ball. Yes. Uh, it's no ball, yes. right? It that's starts right. to. And it's incredible. Incredible. Because that's just our brain. Yes. Playing on us. Yes. Playing tricks on us. That's true. We need to be careful. You know, anxiety is definitely, is, it's dangerous. Yes. And people don't, don't realize that. And I'm always afraid of social media. I'm a yeah. social media fan. I love it, social media. Yeah. But I need to watch clothes, and I teach that to my children. You're, you're not the guys taking pictures standing on the bike while it's riding. Oh, I do eventually. <laughs> I hope I hope the high patrol don't see that, but eventually I do. 
and yeah you know it's so, so you want so your, your your aim right now is your kids mm -hmm. your kids are your priority so yes. you just want to make sure they follow the right path you've given them you've brought them to america you've put them into schools you you're trying to provide for them so that they become independent and now they're living their own lives and knowing the fact that what you've set up for them which sometimes i think in a, a father's perspective normally doesn't get appreciated you know that who cares about the electricity going on who cares about the toilet paper who cares? <laughs> exactly, yeah. this is the part of, of yeah. the man right the man doesn't get appreciated like that so uh, this is what you're trying to set up for your kids just just the foundation is what it is yes that's what it sounds like yes you. exactly and this is what drives you right now yes exactly miko i want to thank you for your time here it's uh, always a pleasure and um Thank you for coming out to us. Thank you very much for inviting me and having me here today. Thank you. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Still do this photo show. Hey.